Hi, welcome to my presentation on Chapter 8, Energy and Enzymes. Uh, so this chapter is going to be kind of about, well, it'll be about energy and enzymes, which have to do with metabolism. Uh, and as I had mentioned, the metabolism of an organism is all of the chemical reactions that happen within uh, its cells or, you know, within its cell if it's a single-celled organism. In general, you can break those reactions down into two different kind of sides of metabolism, the making reactions and the breaking reactions. Uh, so catabolism is all of the chemical reactions in a cell that take larger molecules and break them down into smaller molecules. Anabolism is all of the chemical reactions in a cell that take smaller molecules and put them together to build larger molecules. Catabolism uh, generally is used to generate energy. Uh, it also generates heat, um, and some of the energy that's generated by catabolism is stored in the form of ATP. So when you are eating food and metabolizing that food to get energy out of it, that's all a set of catabolic reactions that ultimately will transfer the energy from your food molecules into ATP and some heat. That's just kind of lost as a, as a byproduct. Um, for anabolic reactions, those do not generate energy. Instead, they require energy to proceed. So the ATP that you make through catabolism will then be used in anabolism to build larger molecules for the cell. Um, and also, you do generate some heat in, in anabolism. Actually, any time that you have a chemical reaction occur, you will end up losing some energy as heat. So basically, catabolism is for breaking big things down into small things and making energy. Anabolism is for putting things, small things together into big things, and it requires energy from catabolism. Um, usually, when we have a, a task kind of to get done in the cell uh, involving the metabolism or chemical reactions in the cell, uh, it'll be more than one chemical reaction that needs to occur, and they'll, they'll be kind of like a sequence of reactions that occur, you know, in a certain order, uh, and we call that a metabolic pathway. So, for instance, if you're going to take glucose as a food molecule and break that down to get energy out of it and store that energy as ATP, that's not just one chemical reaction, that's a very long chain of chemical reactions that all need to occur in order, in order for that to happen. So we call that a metabolic pathway. This diagram here is actually showing all of the known metabolic pathways in uh, human cells. Um, so of course it's very, very detailed and you really can't read what's going on there because it's too small. Um, this used to be available for purchase actually and it would basically fill up a whole wall. Um, you know, if it's going to be big enough for you to actually read all the little abbreviations that are there. But all of these lines are the metabolic pathways that are known in human cells. So as you can see, it's quite a lot. Metabolism is extremely complicated. The basic purpose of metabolism is twofold. First, you have uh, the need for, you know, growing and reproducing. So uh, metabolism is used to build molecules for the cell that let the cell grow and divide. Then you can have more cells. Um, so an organism will need metabolism in order to grow. And then um, when it's time to uh, create new life, of course, metabolism is required for that as well. Um, the other purpose of metabolism is to maintain homeostasis, which is just basically stable internal conditions within the cell um, so that the cell can keep living. Uh, so for instance, you need to maintain your body temperature within a set range in order for your cells to live. Um, so maintaining that body temperature is a, is a type of homeostasis. Maintaining your pH, your blood pH at a normal level is, is part of homeostasis. Some of the most important players in metabolism are enzymes. Enzymes, as we had mentioned in the previous chapter, are proteins that act as catalysts. Um, and a catalyst is a chemical that is going to help a chemical reaction go faster, but will not be involved in that reaction as a reactant or a product. So it doesn't get changed in the reaction at all. If a catalyst is a protein, then we call that an enzyme. You can always recognize enzymes uh, because the name of the enzyme will always end with ASE or ACE. Um, so this uh, slide has kind of a basic summary of how metabolism would generally proceed 
Um, so you start with nutrients that enter the cell, then you have catabolic reactions that will break those nutrients down. Um, usually the results, the products for those uh, reactions, those catabolic reactions, well, it would include some waste products actually. It will also include uh, precursor molecules and ATP. So energy from these nutrients is going to be extracted in these catabolic reactions and end up as ATP. Of course, you also have some more energy that is lost as heat. Then the ATP and these precursor molecules will move on into anabolic reactions. First, the precursors will be put together to make building blocks, for instance, amino acids or um, nucleotides. Those would be examples of building blocks. Um, that process requires ATP, uh, and you'll also lose some energy as heat. Then once you have your building blocks, you can link them together to form macromolecules like proteins made out of amino acids or like DNA or RNA made out of nucleotides. And then once you have your macromolecules, you can build cellular structures, conduct the processes of life. Um, and ultimately the cell is going to be making uh, basically double of everything that it has is going to be just growing uh, as it gets bigger it'll make more cellular structures and once it's gotten to be about twice as big as when it uh, kind of began in life it can divide in general so you're always kind of starting with catabolism to get energy out of nutrients stored as atp um, and then in anabolism you're using that atp to build first building blocks and then macromolecules for the cell um, every step in that process is going to require an enzyme. Um, so every single chemical reaction that needs to occur in all of those metabolic pathways has an enzyme that is supposed to catalyze it and make it go faster. Some of those enzymes also have cofactors that they need, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's just an extra molecule that they need to work. Um, and if we're talking about the anabolic steps in metabolism, those need energy as well as uh, so they're going to need the enzymes and they're also going to need energy, uh, which is usually in the form of ATP. But um, sometimes you might use a different type of energy source. Um, for instance, uh, plants would use light for certain anabolic reactions. So um, as we start getting more into enzymes, first we'll just go over some basic vocab words that are related to them. First, you have a substrate. A substrate is a reactant in a chemical reaction that the enzyme is going to catalyze and the enzyme is going to bind to it. Um, so the first step in catalyzing a chemical reaction for an enzyme is going to be finding its substrate and binding it. Uh, once the enzyme has the substrate attached, it's going to catalyze a chemical reaction between that substrate and another reactant, or maybe it'll break the substrate into, into pieces for a catabolic reaction. The part of the enzyme where this is occurring is called the active site. So where the enzyme is actually binding the substrate and where you have catalysis occurring, that is the active site. That is kind of the most important part of the whole enzyme. Sometimes you might have a mutation in the enzyme that changes um, some aspect of its structure. Um, and if that's kind of far away from the active site, that might be okay actually. Uh, but any amino acid that is at the active site, it's really important for it to have the particular chemical properties that it has or else uh, the enzyme won't function. So all of the amino acids around the active site are the most important amino acids in the, in the whole enzyme in general. Some enzymes have cofactors that they need. A cofactor is just another molecule uh, that has to also bind to the enzyme before it can uh, perform catalysis. So if you have an enzyme that needs a cofactor, it's not going to actually work unless it has that cofactor around. Uh, a lot of cofactors are actually vitamins that we get in our diet. And, and again, just not, not every single enzyme needs a cofactor. Actually, there's a lot of enzymes that do not need cofactors at all, and, and some that won't work without their cofactor. Then finally, we have prosthetic groups. A prosthetic group is um, an assembly of atoms um, that is covalently bonded to the enzyme, uh, but is not part of an amino acid. So in general, it's going to be another molecule that is actually covalently bonded to the enzyme, um, and it's not an amino acid. So, uh, you know, the enzymes are made out of amino acids. It's an amino acid chain that folds up into a particular shape to form, to form the enzyme. And then if you attach anything to that, 
um, using covalent bonds and it's not an amino acid, then that's going to be a prosthetic group. So for example, some enzymes will have a sugar that gets attached to them that counts as a prosthetic group because it's atoms that are not, you know, forming an amino acid. Um, really common would be to have a phosphate group uh, that gets attached to the enzyme. There's actually a lot of different prosthetic groups that can be used, but actually the phosphate group is the most common one. Um, usually, if you're an enzyme that is using prosthetic groups, that means that um, you know, when, when you have that prosthetic group attached, you are kind of active and functional, and when it detaches, then you inactivate. And the image here is showing an example of an enzyme. Um, this is a trypsin enzyme, enzyme which is going to degrade proteins. Um, you can see in red, blue, and yellow here, these are three amino acids that are in the active site of that enzyme. Uh, this purple thing is a substrate for the enzyme. Uh, so this particular enzyme that breaks down proteins is going to grab proteins and, you know, break them into smaller pieces. Uh, so its protein substrate will attach to it at the active site. And then you have these amino acids at the active site that are going to split this protein into two pieces. Um, and that is the chemical reaction that they are catalyzing. This particular enzyme does not uh, need a cofactor or a prosthetic group in order to function. In order to understand why we need enzymes uh, catalyzing reactions in cells and how those enzymes are working, uh, we need to understand uh, a little more about how chemical reactions work and how energy and chemical reactions work. Uh, so a lot of the reactions in the cell that are important, uh, that are you know extra important for us, especially in catabolism, are redox reactions or reduction oxidation reactions. Any chemical reaction in which an electron is being moved from one molecule to another counts as a redox reaction or a reduction oxidation reaction. So there's actually tons of different reactions where an electron gets transferred. So there's many, 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 many redox reactions that happen in a cell. A lot of them involve oxygen, but not all of them involve oxygen. Um, so the definition of a uh, redox reaction that we'll be using is just, you know, any reaction where an electron is transferred. If you're in chemistry, though, actually there's a different definition that is more complicated than that. Um, but, you know, transferring an electron is good enough for us. Every redox reaction has two parts. It has the reduction part and then it has the oxidation part. A reduction is where a molecule gains an electron. An oxidation is where a molecule loses an electron. So anytime you have one molecule being oxidized and losing an electron, uh, that means that electron needs to go somewhere. So it's going to end up going to another molecule that will gain that electron. And that's the reduction part of the reaction. Reduction is not spontaneous. It requires energy for um, a molecule to pick up an electron. But oxidation is spontaneous. Um, for, an, for any molecule that would lose an electron, it can do that without, uh, without any extra energy being put in. And in fact, when it loses the electron, energy will be released. So in general, um, when you have a redox reaction, that means that the molecule that is losing an electron is releasing energy, that is a spontaneous process, and then that energy goes to power um, the other molecule being able to pick up that electron. Uh, which is non-spontaneous, but it's going to go forward because it has the energy that was released by the oxidation part. When a molecule picks up an electron in reduction, we say that it has been reduced. Um, and because it's gained an electron, now it has more chemical energy than it had before. Um, when, when the other molecule involved in the redox reaction loses its electron, we say that it has been oxidized um, and it's going to have less chemical energy than it had before since it lost that electron. So when you have an electron moving from one molecule to another, uh, you're also transferring chemical energy with that electron from the first molecule to the second or from the oxidized molecule to the reduced molecule. Um, it can be hard sometimes to remember like which is which between reduction and oxidation. Um, 
you know, you might think that reduction means that it would have like less electrons, but actually it's the other way around, it gains an electron. It's actually called reduction because when you gain an electron, um, that has a negative charge, so the charge of the molecule will go down, so it, the reduction refers to the charge being reduced. Um, oxidation uh, is just called that because at first we only knew about oxygen as kind of the main, mole uh, the main atom that would lose uh, electrons. We can always remember which one is which uh, using the memnonic oil rig. Oil rig stands for oxidation is lose, losing, reduction is gaining. So oxidation is losing an electron, reduction is gaining an electron. And this diagram is just kind of summarizing that process. Uh, here you have your molecule that is going to be oxidized. Uh, here's your molecule that will be reduced. When they react together, this electron in red transfers from the first molecule to the second. So it goes from this molecule over to this molecule, which is um, reduction. When this molecule that has no electron picks up an electron, that's reduction. And when the first molecule that started with the electron loses it, that is oxidation. So both of those kind of have to happen at one time. The reduction and the oxidation happen at the same time, basically. They always have to go together. Uh, because when one molecule loses an electron, that always means that somebody needs to pick that electron up. Uh, so you end up with, in your products, an oxidized molecule that has lost an electron and a reduced molecule that has gained an electron. So a really common example of a redox reaction that uh, doesn't occur in cells actually, but uh, something kind of like it occurs in, shell, in cells is just the process of burning sugar. So that reaction is written out at the bottom here. Um, on the reactant side, you have glucose, which is your sugar. Then you have oxygen, which you always need in order to burn something. Um, once these two molecules react together, you end up having carbon dioxide as a product and water as a product, and of course, energy that is released in the fire. Um, so this is a redox reaction, even though electrons aren't actually traveling from one molecule to another in this reaction. So it's a little weird for it to be considered redox, but the reason it's considered redox is because your reactants have nonpolar covalent bonds where the electrons are equally shared in the middle and the products have uh, polar covalent bonds where the electrons are not evenly shared. So if you look at glucose, uh, the electrons we're talking about would be uh, you know, involved in these bonds between carbon and carbon and carbon and oxygen. You also have some bonds between carbon and oxygen, uh, sorry. <laughs> our nonpolar our nonpolar bonds here are between carbon and carbon and carbon and hydrogen. You also have some bonds between carbon and oxygen that are actually polar covalent bonds because oxygen is a lot more electronegative than carbon is. Uh, but most of the bonds here that are involved in the reaction are going to be um, either carbon to carbon or carbon to hydrogen. And then your other reactant is just molecular oxygen or O2. Um, of course, oxygen has the same electronegativity as oxygen, so those are going to be nonpolar covalent bonds. So in most of these bonds, the electrons are in the middle. They're perfectly shared in the middle of the bond. After the chemical reaction occurs, you have carbon dioxide and water as your products. Both of those are involving just um, like exclusively polar covalent bonds. So there are no nonpolar covalent bonds left in these product molecules. Uh, if we look at carbon dioxide, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so it's gonna pull the electrons over to it. Um, if we look at the water, uh, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it pulls the electrons over towards it or towards itself. Um, so your oxygen in the reactants is in O2. It's involved in nonpolar covalent bonds. Uh, it ends up in CO2 and water involved in uh, polar covalent bonds. So it starts off with the electrons that are further away from it. It ends up with the electrons that are closer to it. So that's why we say that uh, it's involved in a redox reaction. And in this case, the oxygen is actually being reduced because it starts with electrons that are further from it, it ends with the electrons that are closer to it, um, so it's like it's gaining electrons, which means that it would be reduced, since reduction is gaining. Um, then for carbon, that starts with electrons that are you know, in the middle of its nonpolar covalent bonds, uh, and it ends up with electrons that are further away from it. So it starts off with nonpolar covalent bonds, it ends up with polar covalent bonds in which oxygen has pulled electrons farther away from it. 
So it's like it's losing electrons because the electrons are moving further away, which means that it is uh, being oxidized in this reaction since oxidation is losing electrons. So even just reactions where we start with kind of nonpolar covalent bonds in our reactants and we end up with polar covalent bonds in our products, those can count as redox reactions because the electrons are going to start in the middle of a bond and then they're going to end up moving closer to one atom and farther away from a different atom. If we look at this uh, reaction, we can kind of try to figure out um, if it would spontaneously occur or not. Uh, so first we notice that um, it has a reaction of glucose, which is kind of a more complicated molecule, but its products are just carbon dioxide and water. So those are both small, simple molecules. So this is like a type of catabolic reaction where you have a larger, more complicated molecule that is getting broke down, broken down into simpler molecules. Usually when you have your products being simpler than your uh, reactants, uh, that means that um, entropy is increasing and that means that the reaction is more likely to be spontaneous. Then if you look at chemical energy, uh, glucose actually has a lot of chemical energy stored in these uh, nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, and when you're looking at the products, you don't have any more of those nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, so in general, bonds that have more energy are going to be longer. Bonds that have less energy are going to be shorter. Um, and when you have a nonpolar covalent bond with the electrons in the middle, that's always going to be a longer bond than a polar covalent bond that has the electrons towards one side. Polar covalent bonds are just always ending up shorter than the nonpolar covalent bonds. So that means that they're always going to have kind of less energy that is associated with them. So here we have products that are more complicated and have more energy, more chemical energy stored in their bonds. Um, sorry, uh, I have misspoken in there. We have reactants <laughs> that have more energy uh, in their bonds and we have you know, more complicated reactants, and we end up with products that are simpler and have less energy in their bonds because their bonds are shorter. So uh, that would kind of suggest to us that the reaction is going to be spontaneous. And indeed, <laughs> this reaction is spontaneous. Uh, but actually, as you know, of course, if you have a pile of sugar, it doesn't just like start burning. <laughs> um, it'll just sit there as sugar, uh, but it is a spontaneous reaction. So technically, if you have sugar and air and you wait for like, you know, all eternity to pass, it will burn very slowly. It'll eventually all convert to carbon dioxide and water, uh, you know, eventually. Um, because it is spontaneous. But you know, the fact that it doesn't happen right away kind of lets you know that it needs something still to start going. So even though it's a spontaneous reaction, it still needs some kind of energy to be put in, like a spark, to make it start. Just like a fire is a spontaneous reaction, but it always needs a spark to get going. And the final point that I'll make about this reaction is that um, you, you might actually be familiar with this reaction already. Um, I'm sure they talked about it uh, in high school. Uh, this is a very famous reaction, glucose and oxygen turning into carbon dioxide and water. Um, one glucose plus six oxygen uh, you know, equals <laughs> six carbon dioxides and six waters. Um, so this is the basic summary reaction for cellular respiration. It's also the reaction for sugar burning. Um, but actually this reaction does not happen in cells. So ultimately, your cells are taking glucose and combining it with oxygen, uh, well, using oxygen also to create carbon dioxide and water and energy, which is stored as ATP. Uh, but they're not actually burning sugar. You don't have any, any burning anywhere inside of your cells, actually. Um, so what's happening in cells is actually a lot more complicated than this. And when we go over uh, respiration later in the semester, we'll come back to this reaction um, and we will look at all of the processes involved with converting that glucose to carbon dioxide and, uh, you know, getting energy, um, getting energy out of it in the form of ATP. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a long metabolic pathway that basically, uh, you know, converts glucose ultimately to carbon dioxide, also requires oxygen and produces water and, uh, and, and you know, produces energy in the form of ATP.
So sometimes in metabolism, you have one reaction or set of reactions occurring in one part of the cell and another set of reactions occurring in, the other, in another part of the cell, and you have to transfer electrons from the first set of reactions to the second set of reactions. So you have to move those electrons in the cell. Um, a, a big example of that is actually cellular respiration and the set of reactions that ultimately are extracting energy out of glucose and converting it to ATP. Some of those reactions happen in one part of the cell, the rest of them happen in, in another part of the cell, and you have to move electrons from the first set of reactions to the second. That is accomplished using molecules called electron carriers. So electron carriers are basically just molecules that pick up electrons um, and then move in the cell to another place and drop those electrons off on another molecule. Uh, usually those electron carriers are going to be carrying the electrons in the form of hydrogen atoms. Since a hydrogen atom is just a proton and an electron, anytime you move a hydrogen atom from one molecule to another, you're actually moving an electron as well. So <laughs> all, all reactions where hydrogen atoms are transferred from one molecule to another are actually counting as redox reactions also. Um, so any reaction where you kind of have nonpolar covalent bonds in the, in the reactants and then polar covalent bonds in the products, also any reaction where hydrogen atoms are moving around, those are all redox reactions. So you kind of have those reactions hiding in a lot more places than you might immediately suspect. Uh, the main electron carrier that is used by our cells is NADH. Another one is FADH2. And then plants also use NADPH. Those are kind of the forms of those molecules when they are already carrying electrons. Uh, each of them is able to carry two different electrons on it. So since that's the form that has electrons on it, that's going to be the reduced form. So NADH, NADPH, and FADH2, those are the reduced forms of the electron carriers that have electrons on them. Um, the oxidized form of the electron carrier, where it does not have electrons on it, uh, for NADH, that would be NAD+. For NADPH, it's NADP+. And for FADH2, it's FAD. So in each case, if you start with NAD+, NADP+, or FAD, and you add two hydrogen atoms to it, you're going to end up with NADH, NADPH, and FADH2. Um, two electrons would be transferred. One of them would just be in the hydrogen atom, and then the second hydrogen atom is actually, um, for most of those, going to be split, and you will just have the electron end up on the electron carrier. So if you have your kind of your first set of reactions in kind of place A in the cell and you need some electrons to go from there to a second place in the cell for some more reactions to occur, um, maybe you would have NAD plus come to the first place in the cell and it would pick up some electrons. So in, when it's NAD plus, it is oxidized. When it picks up those electrons, it converts to NADH and now it is reduced. Uh, it is going to travel as NADH to that second place in the cell and drop off its electrons there. When it drops its electrons off, it becomes oxidized again and you know will be NAD plus again. Then it can go back to the first place in the cell and pick up some more electrons and the cycle can just kind of continue. Um, if you look at the structure of those electron carriers, they actually look really similar to nucleotides, which are the building blocks for DNA and RNA. Um, but your body actually isn't able to produce them itself. Instead, it has to use vitamins to create those electron carriers. So NAD plus and NADP plus are both uh, made from vitamin B3 and FAD is made from vitamin B2. Um, here you have uh, an image of NAD, uh, NADH. Uh, actually, technically, this is NAD+, plus, as you can tell, because the nitrogen has a, a positive charge. Um, so is, this is basically looking really similar to a nucleotide. A nucleotide will always have this part. It'll also have this ribose sugar, and it'll have a phosphate group on it as well. Um, it's also very similar to ATP, actually. Um, ATP, the adenosine part, has this or something very similar to this and it has this and then it just has three phosphates um, instead of two phosphates and then another you know ribose and base on it so you don't need to know really like the details of that structure just you know it is quite similar to building blocks for dna or to atp itself a lot of enzymes need ATP as a source of energy in order to catalyze the reactions that they need to catalyze. 
So of course ATP is the main molecule that cells will use to store energy for kind of immediate use. If they want to store energy for a longer period of time, they would use a different molecule. Maybe they would use fat or they might use glycogen. Um, but when they're looking to just store some energy for a moment before, just right before using it, or you know, to have energy in kind of a ready to use format, they're going to use ATP uh, in most cases. ATP is just an adenosine molecule that has three phosphate groups attached to it. As I had kind of mentioned before, um, you have an image of it here. Uh, here in blue and red, you have the adenosine part. And then in yellow, you have your three phosphate groups. Uh, if you look at this, of course, this is pretty similar actually to, uh, to NAD+. Um, you know, you have, this is actually called a nitrogenous base here, and then you have a ribose sugar, um, so in, and then you have phosphates. So NAD+, also has a nitrogenous base and a ribose and some phosphates. It's actually those three phosphate groups at the end of it that are giving it so much energy or allowing it to store a lot of chemical energy. Uh, so on these phosphates, you end up having negatively charged oxygens that are right next to each other because the phosphates are all linked together. And these negative charges don't like to be right next to each other. So they're kind of pushing, pushing on each other, trying to get away from each other. And when they're pushing on each other, that is straining the bonds between those phosphate groups. So those end up being very long bonds between the two phosphate groups. Well, between any two of these phosphate groups. Um, and in general, long bonds have more energy associated with them. So then if you were to break one of those bonds, you would release all of that energy that is associated with it. Um, and then, of course, you would have ADP afterwards, um, you know, which is an adenosine with two phosphates on it instead of three. Then later on in cellular respiration, you can reattach the last phosphate to get back your ATP. Actually, uh, ATP is storing so much energy in the bond between its last two phosphate groups that when you break off the final phosphate group and release all that energy from the bond, um, if you were to do that with 500 grams of ATP, uh, you would actually generate enough energy that way or release enough energy that way to raise the temperature of a whole kilogram of water by <laughs> one degree Celsius, which might not seem like, like, you know, it might not sound like a lot, <laughs> only one degree Celsius, um, but actually since water has such a really high specific heat capacity, uh, like we had talked about in chapter two, um, it, it takes really a lot of, of energy to raise the temperature of water at all. So raising uh, the temperature of a kilogram of water by, uh, by a whole degree is, is actually really good. It's a lot of energy that is stored in the ATP. And this diagram right here is just showing again kind of that process of removing a phosphate group from ATP. Um, you know, remove that last phosphate group, release some energy, you get ADP as a result, adenosine with two phosphates on it, then you need to get back your ATP by putting that phosphate group back onto the ADP. So in order to add that phosphate group back onto the ADP and get yourself ATP back, you have to put in energy. Um, you have to put in extra energy. Uh, different organisms might get that energy that has to be put in from different sources. For instance, plants get it from light, but uh, mammals and you know animals in general will get it from a food molecule, like from glucose. Um, so actually the process of cellular respiration is just uh, the process that cells use to get, uh, well, to get energy out of glucose and use it to attach uh, free phosphate onto ADP, giving them ATP back. So that's the basic purpose of cellular respiration. Um, there's also other ways that cells can do that. There's uh, kind of other energy sources that they can use to attach a phosphate to ADP and get ATP back, uh, but none of them are quite as efficient as cellular respiration. So you're not gonna be able to make as much ATP in those other processes. And we'll kind of go over them um, you know, later in the semester when we get into cellular respiration. So this diagram is kind of going over uh, how ATP can actually be used as a source of energy to uh, make sure that non-spontaneous reactions proceed. A non-spontaneous reaction is always going to require some source of energy in order for it to go. And your anabolic reactions are all non-spontaneous. So they all need energy to proceed. And usually that energy is going to be coming from ATP. Um, so this, this is kind of a graph. Uh, you have, 
basically time on the um, on the x-axis or reaction progress. So you're starting with the reactants on the left-hand side uh, and you end up with products on the right-hand side as the reaction proceeds. Um, then on the y-axis, you have energy. Um, so on the bottom, you're showing the reaction, the non-spontaneous reaction, uh, kind of what it would look like without ATP. So in this reaction, we have molecule A and molecule B, and we're trying to put them together to make molecule AB. So that's going to be an anabolic reaction because we're starting with two smaller molecules. We're putting them together to make a bigger molecule. It's also going to be non-spontaneous because we're starting with simpler molecules and putting them into something that is more complicated. Um, so we start with uh, these reactants that have basically an energy of zero. Um, so we could figure that they don't have any chemical energy stored. Actually, in real life, of course, they would have some chemical energy stored, but we're just kind of setting them to zero for this example. Um, the product that they form, AB, actually has more energy than they have uh, because of this bond, this extra bond that is formed. Um, it has just a little bit more energy in the products than what the reactants have. Uh, so that's not going to happen by itself. If you just have A and B and you have nothing else, then you know, you're never going to raise the energy of those reactants until they can form the products. If you can't put that extra little bit of energy in, then you can't form this product. So ATP is going to solve this problem by basically being a source of energy. On the top here, you're showing the same reaction, but now ATP is involved as well. So now ATP is gonna be a reactant in this reaction. Uh, that means that your reactants now have like some energy <laughs> because ATP has a lot of energy. Uh, so now instead of these reactants having no energy at all, they have more energy. Um, if you're looking them at them as a group of ATP and A and B, because all of that energy is in the ATP. So this reaction is going to go forward in basically two steps. The first thing that's going to happen is that an enzyme is going to break this uh, last phosphate group off of the ATP and transfer it to B. So you, you see that having happened here. So now you have a DP, just two, two phosphates on it, and you have that last phosphate group attached to B to form BP. Um, so when that happens, you're breaking this bond between the last phosphate group on ATP um, and, and the, uh, the second to last phosphate group. So you're releasing a lot of energy there. So the energy uh, level of these reactants is gonna go down as they form the products of this intermediate reaction. Um, you still have more energy here than you have in your uncoupled reaction uh, with just A and B and no ATP because you are still ending up with some energy that's stored in this bond between uh, B and the phosphate group. So this bond still has energy in it uh, that needs to be released. So in the second step of the reaction, you're actually going to have an enzyme that breaks the phosphate group off of B and uses the energy that's released from that reaction to attach A and B together. And so you end up with your final product of AB and a phosphate group and ADP. So I had mentioned that um, the combustion of glucose or burning sugar is a spontaneous reaction, but of course it doesn't occur just because you have some sugar sitting out in the air. Uh, you need to have a spark in order for the reaction to occur, even though it's spontaneous. Um, so that spark, um, in kind of chemistry terms, is called the activation energy for the reaction. The reason why you need activation energy is because of something called the transition state. Uh, the transition state is kind of the state of the reactants when they're in the middle of the reaction. So they're kind of not really the reactants anymore, but they're not the products yet. You have some reactant bonds that are breaking. You have some product bonds that are forming at the same time. And the transition state is actually shown in this diagram here. So again, this graph is similar to the previous graph where you have the reaction progress on the x-axis as the reactants um, you know, form the products. Then on the y-axis, you have energy. Uh, so you start with your reactants of A and BC, and your products are going to be AB and C. So you're basically taking B and transferring it from C to A in your products. Uh, right in the middle of this reaction, you have the transition state. In the transition state, you have this bond between A and B 
that is in the process of forming, but it's not fully formed yet. At the same time, your bond between B and C is breaking, but it's not fully broken yet. So that's why the bonds are shown with these kind of dot, dot, uh, bleh, dashed lines, <laughs> uh, because they're both, um, well, they're, they're not really like completely made or completely broken bonds. They're just in transition. So the transition state is kind of theoretical, as in like no one's ever like directly observed it because <laughs> it only lasts for an instant. Um, just basically, as soon as you enter the transition state, you're leaving it already. Uh, but we do know that it occurs because of the energy changes in the reaction. Or maybe I should say, like, we're, we're pretty sure that it occurs. <laughs> we're pretty sure. <laughs> when you're in the transition state, it's very, very unstable, which is the reason why it only lasts for an instant, or probably, you know, actually a fraction of an instant. Um, so these bonds that are like partly broken, but not really broken or partly formed, but not really formed yet. Uh, they're very long. Um, they're under a lot of stress <laughs> and they're very long, which means they have a lot of energy associated with them. Um, and in general, the more energy you have associated with a bond, the less stable it's going to be, uh, or the more energy you have associated with, you know, with anything, <laughs> the less stable it's going to be. Uh, so the transition state has a lot of energy and it's very unstable. Since it's so unstable, it only lasts just a fraction of a moment. Um, and since it has a lot of energy, in order for the reaction to actually proceed, you have to put in enough energy to reach the transition state. That is the activation energy of the reaction. So you start out with a certain amount of energy in the reactants. You, in this particular reaction, you're ending up with less energy in the products. So the products have less energy than the reactants, which means that this reaction should probably be spontaneous because it's releasing energy. It's releasing this much energy. Uh, but in order for it to go forward, you have to put in enough energy to get to the transition state. So you put that energy in, you get up to the transition state, then as soon as the transition state forms, it resolves and you end up with your products. Um, when that happens, the energy drops down. Um, you get back all of that energy that you put in to reach the transition state. And then you also get back the extra energy um, or you get out the extra energy that is just going to be released by that reaction. Um, so, you know, we don't say that these reactions are non-spontaneous and require energy, even though they do still require an activation energy because you're going to get that energy back. You have to put it in but it's to reach the transition state. But as soon as you leave the transition state, you get all of that activation energy back out. So that ultimately, um, you know, it's kind of energy neutral. But you do still need, like, you know, you need that spark. Usually that reaction energy is going to be coming from basically molecules colliding, um, which is heat. Well, you know, heat is molecules moving. And then when they hit each other, um, you know, you're releasing some extra energy. So... Normally, if you had A and BC, um, they would just be kind of, you know, maybe they're in solution together, so they're going to be floating around, tumbling past each other. Um, depending on what temperature the solution is at, that's determining, like, how fast they're going to be moving. The more quickly they're moving, the more energy, of course, or more kinetic energy they have associated with them. Then if they hit each other, um, you're going to release that energy, and that can provide enough energy to reach uh, the transition state. So the activation energy is usually going to just come from molecules moving it around at a certain speed and then hitting each other. Um, if they hit each other with enough force, then they can reach the transition state. Um, but actually, they also have to collide with each other in the correct orientation. <laughs> so, you know, in this particular reaction, you want A to react uh, with B. So you need, you need to bond to form between A and B to reach the product of AB. Uh, so if A comes in and hits this BC molecule on this side, so it hits the B side, then that's fine. It's going to hit it um, with a certain amount of force that is probably going to be enough force to reach the transition state. Then you're going to have the reaction proceed. Um, but what, what if A came in from the other direction? What if it came in on the C side and hit the C side? Well, then you might have enough energy release to reach the transition state, but you don't have A next to B, so you can't form a bond between A and B if they're not like next to each other. Um, so that reaction is not going to proceed because A came in and hit BC on the wrong side. So A actually needs to hit BC on just the right orientation for the reaction to go forward. And the same is true for any other uh, reaction. You need the molecules to hit each other with enough force to reach the transition state, and they have to hit each other at the correct orientation so that the right bonds that need to form can actually form.
Um, so that means that, you know, you might be waiting for a while for that spontaneous reaction to occur, especially if, if we're talking about kind of a cold condition, like if it's cold, uh, those, those molecules are not going to be moving with a lot of force. And when they hit each other, you might not have enough energy that's released to actually get to the transition state. Um, so enzymes are basically going to be solving these problems for us. So the way that enzymes help us overcome the problem of needing to add activation energy before a reaction can proceed is just by lowering that activation energy. In order to lower the activation energy for a reaction, enzymes have to stabilize the transition state because that activation energy is just the energy that's associated with the transition state. So if the transition state has less energy, that would mean it's more stable. That would mean you need to put in less energy um, as an activation energy to start the reaction. Um, if you don't have enzymes to do that for you, most of the reactions that we rely on for life will basically not be happening within, within our lifetime, uh, you know, even if they're spontaneous. So they will happen, um, you know, eventually, but it might take many, many, many years, maybe, maybe even days, but, you know, for a lot of them, years. In fact, um, the longest half-life that's been measured for a, a spontaneous reaction in the body that we need is, uh, is, the kind of the first step in making heme, which is a molecule that's needed by hemoglobin to, to bond oxygen. Um, and that half-life is 2.3 billion years, which means that if you needed to make one gram of heme um, and you had the reactants to make that, uh, in 2.3 billion years, you would have made half a gram. <laughs> or I should say, you would have made half a gram of that first product. So this is, um, actually kind of showing that uh, that step, the first step in the synthesis of heme. So you start with this particular precursor and you need to alter it to this precursor as the first step. Then there's several more steps and eventually you end up with a functional heme group that you can add to hemoglobin and you know oxygen can attach there. Um, and the only difference between these two molecules is just that this acetyl group here um, is converted to a methyl group. The acetyl group, it looks like this. It's a uh, carbon with two hydrogens and then a carboxyl group, that's an acetyl group. And then the methyl group is just a carbon with uh, three hyd hydrogens attached to it. So just that reaction um, takes 2.3 billion years uh, for half of it to complete spontaneously without enzymes. So of course you can't be waiting you know, for that time, for that amount of time, obviously. But actually you can't even afford to wait days uh, you know, for a lot of the reactions that you need. You really need them like, you know, <laughs> when you need them, you need them when you need them. So you need them to happen kind of right away. Um, with enzymes, um, you can reduce the time it takes for those reactions to occur from years or days to just fractions of a second, just milliseconds. And that's all based on enzymes ability to stabilize the transition state and thereby lower the activation energy that is needed for that reaction to start. So there's a few different ways that enzymes are able to stabilize the transition state and lower activation energy. First, an enzyme is going to grab the reactants as substrates um, and just hold them close together in the right orientation. Um, right, so the, the reactants that need to react together for the, whatever reaction you know, we need to do that's going to be catalyzed by the enzyme, those reactants are usually going to be substrates for the enzyme. So the enzyme is going to grab those reactants um, at its active site and just make sure that those two reactants are held close together um, and in just the perfect orientation. So the two atoms that actually need to make a bond will be like right next to each other. Um, and when you do that, it lowers the activation energy and stabilizes the transition state. Uh, so that kind of theory of how enzymes work by holding things together in the right, in the right position, that's called the lock and key model of uh, enzyme activity. Um, but enzymes can also work in other ways. So sometimes you can have an enzyme that will actually change the shape of its substrate, uh, which would be a reactant, um, so that uh, a particular bond that needs to break will be stressed. Um, so the, you know, the enzyme will grab the reactant as a substrate and then it'll undergo a conformational change that puts some stress on that reactant and it'll be like a particular bond that ends up being kind of, you know, put under strain. Um, and then it just makes it easier for that bond to break and that ends up uh, lowering the activation energy.
Um, another way that enzymes can work is by altering the chemical, chemical conditions in the active site. So for certain reactions, um, they might, you know, uh, go faster at a lower pH or at a higher pH. Um, but, you know, in the body, we need to have a neutral pH. The pH of your blood is 7.4, and it needs to be, like, basically at that level or really, really close to it, uh, or else you will die. <laughs> so if you have a reaction that will, that will happen fast, but only if the pH is 4, you can't have, like, you know, pH 4 in your blood. That's not, that's not compatible with you being alive. So... An enzyme will actually have the ability to have like a lot of acidic amino acids right there in its active site, and that will reduce the pH of the active site so that right there at the active site, the pH actually is 4. The pH in the whole cell is still 7.4, but right there in the active site, it goes down to 4 maybe, and that's what you needed for that reaction. So then the reaction is going to happen really fast. Um, Enzymes can also uh, alter the presence of water. So there's certain reactions that actually would go faster if there's not water around, but of course there is water around everywhere in a cell. <laughs> um, but if you have a lot of hydrophobic amino acids right there in the active site, you're gonna end up with a little pocket where there's basically no water present. Um, you know, and that might be uh, optimal for certain reactions and could help them go faster. And then finally, there's also other things that enzymes do, and we don't know what they are. <laughs> so um, there, there are other ways that enzymes are able to lower the activation energy for reactions uh, that we haven't discovered yet. And this graph here is just showing um, basically how enzymes are working. Um, you know, so here you have a reaction again with reactants on the left, products on the right, and energy is graphed on the y-axis. So this is going to be a spontaneous reaction because you can see that your reactants have more energy than the products. Um, but there still needs to be an activation energy for it. And in the dotted line, you can see the standard activation energy um, that you know would apply if you didn't have an enzyme. So if these reactants were just kind of on their own, uh, this would be the activation energy that they need to reach before you can get to the transition state and complete the reaction. But if you add the enzyme, now the activation energy goes down to this level. So it's way, way lower than it would otherwise be. So now you just need to put in the teensiest little bit of extra energy for the activation energy, and then the reaction will go forward. So I mentioned the lock and key model as kind of a way to explain how enzymes function. Um, this model was first proposed in 1894 by a scientist called Emil Fischer. Um, he actually uh, proposed that reactants would fit into an enzyme the way that a key fits into a lock, which means that for every enzyme, like the active site would be perfectly shaped to fit the substrates. Um, the issue, the only issue with that model basically is that it suggests that enzymes are kind of rigid structures that can't change their shape. Actually, a lot of them do change their shape. So um, once we kind of discovered, you know, that about enzymes, uh, the lock and key model was updated to the induced fit model uh, in 1958 by Daniel Koshland. Um, so the induced fit model is very similar to the lock and key model, except that it also proposes that enzymes can change their shape after they bind the substrate. Um, and then, you know, that shape change is important for the catalysis that the enzymes will perform. So, for instance, when the enzyme changes its shape uh, after binding a substrate, um, that, that could put stress on a particular bond that needs to break, uh, or it can just help squeeze the reactants even closer together. Uh, so it can do different things to stabilize the transition state. Uh, and, and I guess I'm not sure if I mentioned just now, haha, <laughs> but um, that, that little shape change is a conformational change. So the induced fit model is proposing that when a substrate binds its enzyme, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change that helps to stabilize the transition state. And that's basically shown uh, in this kind of diagram up here. Uh, here you have an enzyme, glucokinase, which uh, is going to basically uh, break down glucose. Or I should say that it's kind of like, it's the first step in breaking down glucose, which is a really big process. Uh, but, you know, it is that step number one. So this enzyme is going to use for its substrates glucose and ATP. And basically what it needs to do is transfer a phosphate group from the ATP to the glucose, which will help break the glucose down in the sub subsequent steps. Um, so the active site for that enzyme is right here. 
and these two substrates, ATP and glucose, are going to bind right here. And the, sh the shape of the active site is basically perfect to fit um, its two substrates. Once the substrates have bound to the active site, the enzyme will undergo a conformational change and kind of close in just a little bit around them. And that ends up squeezing these two reactants together um, to make it easier for them to react. So some enzymes, as I've mentioned, have cofactors, which is just a molecule that they need to have in order to function properly. Um, so some enzymes do not have cofactors and they can function just by themselves as long as they have a substrate available. Uh, other enzymes will need a cofactor um, in order to catalyze a reaction on the substrate. Uh, there's two basic types of cofactors. It could either be organic or inorganic. Uh, an, or an organic cofactor is also called a coenzyme. Um, we won't really worry about that term too much in here, but you know, if you've ever seen the word coenzyme, that is a cofactor that happens to be an organic molecule. Like maybe you've seen supplements that contain coenzyme Q. That's a type of organic cofactor. Um, organic cofactors are never proteins. So they can be basically any type of organic molecule, but they're never actually a protein. Um, they include a lot of vitamins and also a lot of um, molecules that are based on vitamins. So you have to have a vitamin to like to manufacture that cofactor. Um, for instance, you could consider NAD plus or NAD plus or FAD. Um, so those electron car carriers as cofactors, um, you know, because there are additional molecules that are required in certain reactions. Um, ATP can also count as a cofactor actually, uh, and a lot of other things as well. Uh, then you also have inorganic cofactors, which is just, you know, any molecule that is not organic, so it's not based on carbon, and it serves as a cofactor. Usually that means it's some type of metal ion. So the reason why you need zinc or magnesium or iron in your diet is because those things are serving as cofactors for certain enzymes. And certain enzymes cannot function if they don't have those things as a cofactor. Um, although iron you also need because uh, your hemoglobin needs it in order to bind oxygen. So this is just kind of a diagram kind of illustrating how that works. In blue, you have the actual enzyme. This particular enzyme needs two different cofactors. So it has a coenzyme or organic cofactor here in red that it requires. And then it also requires this yellow inorganic cofactor, which is probably a metal ion of some type. And if you don't have those two cofactors there, then the active site won't have the right shape and the enzyme will not be able to function. So most of the time when you have catalysis happening in the body, that means that you have an enzyme um, you know, performing the catalysis. But there are a few exceptions um, in cases where you have RNA that actually functions as a catalyst. Anytime that you have RNA that works as a catalyst, we call that a ribozyme. So an enzyme is a protein that functions as a catalyst and a ribozyme is RNA that functions as a catalyst. Um, a ribozyme is just a single strand of RNA that is folded up to make a complicated 3D shape. So that's kind of similar how enzymes are, you know, a chain of amino acids that is folded up to make a complicated 3D shape. And that shape that ribosomes have is what lets them do the catalysis. Um, for an enzyme, the way that it's folded is going to be stabilized by interactions between the backbone or the side chains of the amino acids. For a ribozyme, uh, the shape is going to be stabilized by base pairing, um, you know, with of the strand with itself. So it's basically a single strand that will kind of loop back around on itself, and then it can base pair with itself. Uh, so you have, if you have an A on one part of the strand, that could base pair with a T on another part of the strand if it had looped around, so on and so forth. So these diagrams here are just showing um, an example of a, of a ribozyme. Um, this one is showing, uh, it's kind of a simplified view of its structure. This particular ribosome is actually composed of two different strands of RNA that are kind of uh, intertwined together. And also you can see the areas where they're base pairing with themselves. Uh, and then here you have the actual 3D shape that is formed. Um, so there's several ribozymes that are important in the cell, but the most famous one and by far the most important one is rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA, and it's found inside of the ribosome. 
Um, so our RNA is a ribosome, uh, sorry, it's a ribozyme inside the ribosome <laughs> that is able to catalyze uh, the formation of peptide bonds between amino acids. So actually, um, you know, we know that a ribosome builds protein. Uh, it links amino acids together to build a protein. But it's not actually the protein part of the ribosome that is doing that. It's the rRNA. It's the RNA part or the ribosome, uh, ribozyme part that is actually um, making bonds between amino acids uh, to form, you know, first amino acid chain that would then fold up to be a protein. Um, and kind of noticing that, uh, that we have ribozymes that, um, you know, they have genetic information because, you know, they are nucleic acid and they also can do catalysis, so they can do work as well. Um, and noticing that we have our RNA is one of the most important um, catalysts in the cell. Is, is not a protein, it's an RNA. Um, that's kind of led scientists to this idea that possibly RNA kind of came first and DNA and proteins came second. But before you had DNA and protein in the evolution of life, you might have had just RNA. And that idea is called the RNA world hypothesis. And we'll talk more about it uh, later on when we get into our chapter on, uh, on RNA and well, on nucleic acids. So we will finish us up this chapter looking at some things that affect enzyme activity and how the cell is able to control the activity of its enzymes. Uh, so enzyme activity is just, you know, how quickly are the enzymes working to catalyze reactions that they're able to catalyze. Um, two of the main things that can affect enzyme activity are temperature and pH. Every enzyme has kind of an ideal range of temperatures and pH values that it will operate at. And if you go beyond that range, then its activity will drop off. Uh, for temperature, when the temperature gets too high, um, that actually will disrupt hydrogen bonds. And we know that hydrogen bonds are a really important, important part of stabilizing the secondary and tertiary structure of proteins. And that would include enzymes too, of course. So if you have disrupted hydrogen bonds, then that means that um, basically you're going to start losing the structure of the enzyme and that's probably going to denature it and you'll lose its function as well. Especially if you're disrupting the active site, then you'll lose the function of the enzyme quite quickly. For pH, as the pH goes down, you end up having more uh, protons in the solution, and those protons will actually interfere with hydrogen bonding as well, uh, because they're just tiny little charged particles that are able to get in the middle of the hydrogen bond and can also interact with the partially negative uh, partner in the bond. Um, in addition to that, um, the amount of protons that you have in the solution is going to affect the charge on amino acids that are either acidic or basic. Um, so if you have an active site that has a lot of acidic amino acids in there, um, then that, that means you kind of need that negative charge in, in the active site. And if you start playing with the amount of protons that are around, uh, it's possible you might end up forcing those acidic amino acids to actually pick up a proton, which would destroy their, well, you know, it would get rid of their negative charge, uh, and then you would lose the negative charge at the active site, and then the enzyme would stop working. So anytime you have basic or acidic amino acids, the charge on them is actually going to be affected by the pH. So of course, if, the, if you start altering the charge of those amino acids in the active site, that's going to be a problem. But also, um, some of those acidic or basic amino acids might be making hydrogen, uh, sorry, ionic bonds with each other to stabilize the tertiary structure of the enzyme. So if you, if you start messing with the charges, then you might lose some of those ionic bonds and you might have a destabilized structure of the enzyme and that might lead to it being denatured. So this graph here is just kind of showing that um, enzymes will have kind of optimal ranges for temperature and for pH, where they have the most activity and they catalyze reactions the fastest. As you start going beyond that range, either below or above it, then their activity is going to drop off. They're basically designed to work at a particular temperature and pH, and if they're not at that temperature and pH, they're not going to work well. Then this graph is showing um, how charge can be affected on acidic or basic amino acids, uh, depending on the pH. Uh, so on the bottom you have glutamate, and on the top you have lysine. Those are two different amino acids. Glutamate is acidic, and lysine is basic. Um, 
every amino acid that is basic or acidic is going to be affected in a different way by the pH. So it just depends on the specific amino acid. But for glutamate here, we're showing that um, if you're at a low pH value, um, you know, pH value of maybe three or less roughly, then uh, this glutamate is going to uh, have no charge on it. Um, but as the pH increases to higher values, by the time you've gotten to a pH of six, the glutamate has dropped uh, a proton and so it has a negative charge. So since it's acidic, it tends to drop a proton. So at most of pH values, it will have dropped that proton and it'll have a negative charge. But if you were to reduce the pH to a really low level, then that glutamate would actually pick up a proton instead, and that would get it uh, a neutral charge on it. Um, for lysine, that's a basic amino acid, uh, and this graph is showing this, showing us that if we're at basically pH level eight or below, um, then we're going to have a positive charge on that lysine, which means that it has picked up a proton, uh, a proton <laughs> as bases do. Uh, but if you started to increase the pH to a really high level, by the time you get to a pH of around 12 or above, uh, that that amino acid would actually have lost its proton, so it would have an, uh, a charge of zero. So again, exactly how pH is going to affect the charge of different amino acids is going to depend just on the specific amino acid that you're talking about. So as I kind of mentioned, every enzyme is going to have a range of conditions, uh, especially uh, as regards temperature and pH, that they kind of function the best at. Um, and you have, of course, different organisms that live in different environments. So every organism is going to have enzymes that are adapted or optimized for the conditions in that environment where the organism lives. Uh, so these graphs are just kind of showing an example of that. Um, on the first graph here, you have temperature on the x-axis. On the second graph, you have pH on the x-axis. And for both graphs, on the y-axis, you have enzyme activity. Um, so as the activity goes up, that means that the enzyme is catalyzing reactions faster. As the activity goes down, that means the enzyme is catalyzing the reactions uh, less fast. And we've got graphed on these graphs <laughs> uh, enzymes from a couple of different species. So in blue here, we have uh, an enzyme from a microbe, from a bacteria that lives in, uh, we're told, in a cool and neutral environment. So maybe that's just like the soil, it could be just some soil bacteria. So this enzyme is going to have its peak activity at a relatively cool temperature. Um, actually, uh, you know, 47 degrees Celsius or whatever this is, isn't really, <laughs> it's not really that cool. Um, that is higher than your body temperature, but, you know, it's cool compared to a really extreme environment, such as uh, the red bacteria lives in a more extreme environment, like maybe a hot spring. Uh, it's hot and acidic, so those conditions would apply in certain hot springs. So as regards temperature, your soil bacteria has enzymes that are specialized for working at a lower temperature. Uh, as the temperature drops beyond, below its optimal range or rises above the optimal range, then you see the enzyme activity dropping off. Um, for your bacteria that lives in maybe a hot spring, somewhere that's really hot, um, its enzymes are going to be optimized to work at a higher temperature. Um, whatever temperature that hot spring would be at, basically. And again, as the temperature goes above that range or below it, the uh, activity of the enzyme starts to drop off. And the same thing is shown in this graph for pH. Uh, first, we have our soil bacteria, which lives in you know some neutral soils. Uh, so the pH that its enzymes are optimized to function well at is gonna be you know right around seven, give or take a little bit. Um, and as the pH uh, uh, drops below that level, becoming more acidic, or as the pH rises above that level, becoming more basic, um, then you have the enzyme activity dropping off. Uh, for our hot spring bacteria that lives in an acidic hot spring, it's optimized, um, well, it's, its enzymes are optimized to function best at a low pH. Uh, and as the pH rises beyond that level or drops to a really, really extreme low pH, then the enzyme activity is going to drop off. So basically, just every organism you know, that lives in a particular environment where you have particular conditions, uh, its enzymes will be optimized for that environment. They will work best at whatever conditions are present in that environment uh, in general, assuming that they're well adapted to their environment. Um, and as the conditions start to change beyond that range that their enzymes are optimized for, the function of the enzymes will kind of drop off. 
And that means that that organism is going to be, you know, kind of uh, in some trouble. If it's if its enzymes stop working or they kind of they're still working, but only at half speed or something um, that could be dangerous for that organism, because now the reactions that it needs to uh, get done very quickly in order to survive are going to be happening more slowly, possibly too slowly. A couple other factors that affect enzyme activity are just the substrate concentration and the enzyme concentration itself. So the substrate, of course, is uh, the reactant that the enzyme is going to bind and then catalyze a reaction with it. So if you have more of that substrate around, then, you know, uh, the reactions will go faster. Um, if you only have a little bit of substrate, but you have a lot of enzymes that can use that substrate, um, you know, you can only make a small amount of product because you only have a little bit of substrate. All the enzymes are going to grab that substrate um, or, you know, a few of them will grab the substrate until the substrate is all gone. They'll catalyze a reaction and then that'll be it. You, you're, you're out of your reactant, so you can't make more products. Um, if you were to add more substrate, then, you know, everything will speed up or the rate at which you're forming product is going to speed up. It's actually not going to speed up just indefinitely. At a certain point, as you're increasing the substrate concentration, you're going to hit what they call a saturation point. When you're at the saturation point, that means that all of the enzymes that are available um, to catalyze a reaction using that substrate are already busy with the substrate. So they're basically going as fast as they can, and all of them are working, you know, 24/7 or you know continuously, um, and the, so that's your upper limit on how fast you can make the product. Uh, and as you add more substrate, you're not going to make product faster than that. So that's kind of shown in this graph here. Um, on the x, you have substrate concentration, and on the y-axis again, you have enzyme activity. So if you have just a small amount of substrate, you're going to be forming product at maybe a kind of a slow rate. As you start adding more and more substrate, the rate at which you're forming product goes up and up and up until it starts to level off, and then it levels off entirely. And at that point, when it first levels off entirely, that's your saturation point. So at that point, every enzyme that you have available to use that substrate is already busy with the substrate. So when you add more substrate, um, there's no enzymes available to catalyze a reaction using the substrate, so it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't affect the rate at which you're forming the product. Of course, you could overcome that by just adding more enzymes. So the enzyme concentration will also affect, of course, enzyme activity or how quickly you're forming the product. Uh, so if you have more of the enzyme available, you're going to be able to make more product more quickly. If you have fewer enzymes available, then you're going to be making less product less quickly. Another factor that can affect enzyme activity is how much uh, inhibition you have going on. So um, most enzymes will have um, one or more inhibitor molecules um, that exist that can prevent them from functioning, basically. So the inhibitor molecule is going to be some molecule that binds the enzyme in a way that prevents it from catalyzing reactions. Then if you have more inhibitors around, you're going to have more enzymes that are inhibited, and you'll have slower uh, enzyme activity. And if you have less inhibitors around, then of course you're going to have very few enzymes that are inhibited, and you know most of them will be fully active, so you'll have a higher enzyme activity. There's three basic types of inhibitor molecules and three basic types of inhibition for enzymes. You have competitive inhibitors, allosteric inhibitors, and feedback inhibitors. Uh, so in competitive inhibition, the inhibitor molecule just basically looks like the substrate. So it's going to be something that is able to bind the enzyme in the active site. Then when the substrate comes along, um, it can't attach to the active site because it's already full with this inhibitor molecule. That's shown in this diagram right here. Um, so here you have an enzyme in green, and this enzyme has two different substrates, um, and it has three different little pouches in its active site where these substrates are supposed to bind. So for the first substrate, uh, it just has you know one pouch for that substrate. Then the second substrate has kind of these two larger parts of the molecule that are linked together, and each one has its own little pouch in the uh, active site. Um, in purple here, you have a competitive inhibitor. 
for this enzyme. So this is just one molecule that looks like the combination of both of these substrates. It's able to fit into all three of those little pouches in the active site where the substrates are supposed to bind. So when you have this uh, competitive inhibitor bound to that active site, the substrate comes and it tries to bind, but it can't. The, the active site is already full and it's blocked off. So that means that this enzyme is going to be inhibited. It will not be able to function as long as this competitive inhibitor is bound to it. So that's competitive inhibition. You also have allosteric inhibition, where the inhibitor molecule is going to bind to the enzyme someplace that's not the active site, someplace further away from the active site. And when it binds, it's going to change the shape of the enzyme um, and change the shape of the active site so that now the substrate cannot attach there. So that's shown um, on the bottom here, uh, where again you have an enzyme uh, in green, it's basically you know a similar enzyme where it has three pouches in its active site for the two substrates to bind, but it also has another little pouch that's kind of further away from the active site, and that is where an allosteric inhibitor molecule would be able to bind. So when you have that inhibitor molecule bound to its little pouch, the shape of the enzyme is going to change and is kind of squeezing inwards so that now these little pouches in the active site where the substrate are supposed to bind, those pouches are smaller than normal. They start up bigger and then they get smaller when the allosteric inhibitor binds. So now they're actually too small to fit the substrate. The substrate tries to come in here and bind, but the active site is not the right shape for it anymore, so it can't bind. That means that that enzyme is going to be inhibited. It's not going to be able to function as long as you have that allosteric inhibitor molecule attached to it. Then the last type of inhibition is feedback inhibition. In feedback inhibition, it's like a little bit more complicated. Um, you're going to have the product that is formed in the reaction that the enzyme catalyzes actually turning around and inhibiting the enzyme somehow. Uh, so some of those products might inhibit it competitively, but most of them would be inhibiting it allosterically. So uh, usually in feedback inhibition, you're going to have the enzyme catalyzing a reaction. That means that it's producing some type of product, and then that product is going to bind the enzyme somewhere away from the active site and change the shape of the active site so that now the substrate can't bind there anymore. Feedback inhibition is really, really, really common um, in organisms and is really important because it allows you to kind of automatically balance the amount of enzyme activity that you have. Usually you need, you know, only a certain amount of a product and usually you kind of want to conserve your substrates, um, you know, as much as you can, right? You don't want to like use resources that you don't really need. You don't want to produce things that you don't really need because it's just inefficient. Um, so, you know, as you you have an enzyme that's forming product, uh, as you get enough products, you know, and it's, you know, as much product as you need, you kind of would like to stop making more product at that point. So if you have this feedback inhibition, as you're making more and more product, you're going to end up having more and more of the enzymes inhibited by that product, which means that in the future you're going to make less product um, and you'll end up kind of balancing the amount of product that you're forming to use your resources efficiently. So this diagram is kind of um, showing an example of feedback inhibition. A lot of the time, feedback inhibition is going to apply to metabolic pathways, um, where you have kind of a number of reactions occurring in a chain, and uh, you know each of those reactions is going to have its own enzyme that catalyzes it, and at the end of the chain, you're making some product that is needed by the cell. So we have an example of a really short metabolic pathway here. It has three uh, different reactions. Uh, first, you're transforming the substrate into intermediate A. Then you transform intermediate A into intermediate B. Then intermediate B is transformed into the final product, which is the thing that the cell actually needs. Each one of those three reactions has its own enzyme that is going to catalyze that reaction. So you have enzyme one, two, and three. Um, so you start out here with the substrate, binds to its active site on enzyme 1. Um, enzyme 1 will catalyze a reaction that transforms that substrate into intermediate A. Then intermediate A will be bound by enzyme 2 in enzyme 2's active site. Enzyme 2 catalyzes a reaction that converts intermediate A to intermediate B. Then intermediate B is going to bind enzyme 3 in its active site, and enzyme 3 will convert intermediate B into the product which is actually something that's required by the cell. 
then you're going to have feedback inhibition. So as you're making more and more product through this pathway, the product is going to loop back around and come all the way back to enzyme one and attach to this allosteric binding site here, or this little uh, pouch on the side of the enzyme that's away from the active site um, that is for allosteric inhibition by the product. So when the product binds to that little pouch, the active site of enzyme one is going to change its shape and it's going to get smaller so that now the substrate cannot attach there. If you don't have the substrate binding in enzyme one's active site, then you're not going to be making intermediate A. If you didn't make intermediate A, then of course you don't make intermediate B or the final product either. So that means that as you're making more product, um, more and more of your enzyme one molecules are going to be inhibited. So you're going to end up effectively with less and less enzyme one that is available to do reactions, to catalyze the reaction that transforms substrate into intermediate A. As you have less and less enzyme one available to actually function, you're going to be making less and less product in the future. Um, and then as time passes, you're going to start probably using that product. So, you know, as the cell uses the product for whatever its job is, probably that means that the concentration of the product is going to end up dropping. As the concentration of the product falls to be really low, now you're not going to have any product around to bind this uh, um, allosteric binding site anymore. So the product is going to end up letting go um, and being all used up and now enzyme one is going to go back to being functional again and this pathway is going to activate again and you'll start making more product again. So in that way, um, through feedback inhibition, you can kind of prevent the cell from making extra product when extra product isn't needed and it's kind of just automatic. And then at the same time, when you start using that product and you actually do need some more, um, you can make sure that the cell will automatically start making more of it. So it's a really easy way for cells to regulate how much of a product they're making to make sure that they're never making too much or too little. The last factor that can affect enzyme activity is covalent modifications, which basically just means like attaching a prosthetic group to the enzyme. A prosthetic group is always you know, some molecule that is attached to the enzyme using covalent bonds, and this molecule is not an amino acid. So anytime you're attaching a prosthetic group or taking a prosthetic group off of an enzyme, that means you're doing a covalent modification to the enzyme since it's, in, it's attached using covalent bonds. So the most common type of prosthetic group is going to be a phosphate group. Phosphorylation means uh, adding a phosphate group to an enzyme. Um, so whenever you're adding a phosphate group to an enzyme, whenever you're doing phosphorylation, you're going to end up changing something about the enzyme. Usually you're going to end up changing the active site of the enzyme to make it either active or not active. So a lot of the time when you add that phosphate group, you're going to change the active site of the enzyme so it's actually like the correct shape and then the enzyme will activate. But sometimes when you add the phosphate group to the enzyme, you'll actually change the active site to an incorrect shape so that the enzyme will deactivate. Um, which, which event will happen, activation or deactivation, just kind of depends on the enzyme in question. But a lot of enzymes are going to be uh, activated or deactivated or, you know, turned on or turned off by adding or taking away a phosphate group from the enzyme. Um, and I guess I'll just note that usually that phosphate group is coming from ATP. So a lot of the time it, it costs ATP to do this. So you're going to have an ATP molecule come in um, and you'll, you're going to have that enzyme breaking off the, or usually actually a whole different enzyme, <laughs> a different enzyme uh, uh, will come with the ATP and break the last bond in the ATP between those last two phosphate groups, which releases energy. And then this enzyme is going to use that energy to attach that phosphate group uh, that you just broke off of the ATP onto our first enzyme, uh, thereby phosphorylating it. Um, so the phosphate group is the most common type of prosthetic group to be added to an enzyme to turn it on or off, but there's actually other ones that could be added as well. Uh, so, you know, different enzymes will have different prosthetic groups um, that, that can be added or removed from them to turn the enzyme on or off. And the, the uh, figure here is just kind of showing that process. Um, so on the top you have an enzyme. Um, it, we're showing kind of the amino acids in the active site. Uh, you have one important one in blue, another important one in green, uh, and then you have this kind of orange loop is just the all of the amino acids in the active site. Uh, so the blue amino acid and the green amino acid are actually the amino acids that will be 
uh, phosphorylated. So when this enzyme is phosphorylated, you're going to be adding one phosphate group to this blue one and another phosphate group to this green one. Um, but here it's shown in its non or its unphosphorylated form, so it doesn't have any phosphates attached to it right now, and it's actually inactive. So this active site is just not quite the right shape to be actually catalyzing a reaction on the substrate. Then when you add those phosphate groups and you would actually have a second enzyme that comes in and adds these phosphate groups by taking them off of ATP, um, when you add these yellow phosphate groups to the amino acids that are going to be phosphorylated, um, now the orange loop is going to change its shape. It kind of rises up. Um, and that is actually the correct shape for it to have. So this is the active configuration. Whenever the active site looks like this, the enzyme is actually functional. So in this way, for this enzyme, is actually turned on by being phosphorylated. So the last thing we'll talk about is just how cells are able to regulate the activity of their enzymes. And that's really important for any cell. Every cell has to have control of its enzyme activity or the activity of its enzymes in order to survive. Um, because those enzymes are catalyzing reactions that are necessary for metabolism, uh, for all the for the cell to get energy, for the cell to build macromolecules, and for the cell to conduct its basic functions. Um, so con controlling that enzyme activity means controlling the metabolism and basic functions in the cell. So it's really essential. There's three basic ways that cells can regulate the activity of their enzyme. They can regulate enzyme concentration, they can regulate enzyme activation or inhibition, and they can regulate enzyme location. So if you're controlling enzyme activity by controlling enzyme concentration, that basically means that whenever you need the enzyme, you make it, and whenever you don't need it anymore, you break it. Uh, so that's kind of expensive. Uh, it costs energy to make enzymes, and it actually also costs energy to break them and recycle their components. So um, there, there are enzymes that are controlled in that way, but it's maybe a less common way to, to control uh, enzyme activity would be, you know, just building it whenever you need it so that the concentration goes up and then breaking it when you don't need it anymore so that the concentration goes down. Um, a more common way to control enzyme activity is by controlling enzyme act bleh, activation and in inhibition. That's kind of probably the most common way to control enzyme activity. Um, so that means that you're going to basically make the enzyme before you actually need it, but you're not going to start using it right away. So you're going to have some way of keeping it deactivated. So that could be done using uh, covalent modifications, like maybe, uh, maybe this enzyme needs a phosphate group added to it in order for it to be active. So then you, you make the enzyme, but you just don't put the phosphate group yet. Um, or maybe you make an inhibitor molecule as well. So the enzyme is around, but it has an inhibitor attached to it, so it won't function. Um, so then, you know, you have this enzyme that's kind of ready to go, and when you need it, all you have to do is, uh, you know, activate it or get rid of the inhibitor or, you know, add a phosphate group to it, um, you know, whatever you got to do to activate it. Then it'll start functioning. Then when you don't need it anymore, um, then you can just maybe take that phosphate group back off so it deactivates, or you can start making an inhibitor molecule so it'll deactivate. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, a really, really common way of controlling enzyme activity using uh, inhibition is just to use feedback inhibition. So for a lot of enzymes um, that the cell kind of needs to have like all the time, or you know, this is an enzyme where it's making some type of product that the cell kind of always needs, uh, but it only needs it in a certain amount, right? It only needs a certain amount of it, not limitless amounts. <laughs> so then you can have that product, uh, you know, inhibit the enzyme that formed it or one of the enzymes in the pathway that forms it so that when you make more of the product you inhibit the enzyme uh, it becomes less active then when you have less of the product the enzyme will kind of automatically activate as the product isn't there to inhibit it anymore and then you, you form more product automatically. Uh, then finally cells can also regulate enzyme activity by controlling where they're located in the cell um, so this is going to be more common for eukaryotes that have organelles that are bound by membranes. It's less common for prokaryotes where everything is just kind of just kind of floating. <laughs> um, but you know you can find examples of it uh, kind of all over in the tree of life. Um, 
So in, in this kind of way of controlling enzyme activity, you basically make the enzyme before you actually need it, but instead of just using it right away, you, you stash it someplace. Uh, so maybe you're going to uh, store it in a particular organelle and you know it doesn't have the substrate there, so it's not going to be active. Then whenever you need it, you just take it out of that organelle and then it'll be exposed to the substrate and it'll become active and you'll start making product.